Okay, so this video is for AP Bio topic 8.1, uh, responses to the environment. Now, this is not really going to flow like a lot of my videos do, but rather show lots of different examples of how organisms can respond to their environment. So just keep that in mind, like that's our big or overarching goal. And so uh, when we look at different ways that organisms uh, respond to changes in the environment, there's two really like mechanisms. We have behavioral responses as well as physiological responses. And so under the behavioral category, there's taxis and kinesis, migration, temperature regulation are a few examples. And then in the physiological category, we have hibernation, estivation, ooh, circadian rhythms, one of my favorites, as well as phototropism and photoperiodism in plants. So let's go ahead and start with the behavioral. So taxis, or taxis, sorry, is the movement of an organism in response to a stimulus. So there's positive as well as negative taxis. So positive would be moving toward something, uh, and then negative would be away from something. So we've seen this in life when we see insects fly towards light. That would be called a positive photo taxis. Um, and then we also have, like in our immune system, we have what's called chemotaxis. And so when your skin gets cut, the damaged cells are gonna release a chemical called histamine. And that histamine is a signal for your white blood cells to move out of your circulatory system into the damaged or infected tissue to help clean up the pathogens. So here you have these white blood cells moving out of your blood vessels, out of your capillaries, into your tissue and so in response to a chemical messenger basically so that or not chemical messenger sorry but in response to a chemical signal <laughs> which is chemotaxis like moving towards so this is also how sperm can find an egg the egg will release certain chemicals and that helps direct the sperm towards the egg so that would be an example of positive chemotaxis now we also have kinesis and kinesis is the undirected movement of an organism in response to a stimulus. So I grew up camping and there's a lot of times my brother and I would lift up rocks. And when you lift up rocks, um, you can, if there's insects underneath them, a lot of times that sudden bright light is the stimulus and it causes them to like scramble and move real fast, right? So that is an example of undirected movement. They're not like chasing prey or something, but rather just this frantic uh, movement and that would be kinesis. So in this example of insects responding to an increase in light, that's a photokinesis. Now animals too, when we think about life on earth, uh, we can talk about animals in terms of nocturnal animals uh, or diurnal animals. So diurnal animals are ones like humans who generally are awake during the daytime and then sleep at night. Uh, so here this like deer would be diurnal and then this um, little organism, I don't know what it is, uh, is going to be nocturnal. So um, mammals too, depending on if they're awake at night or during the day, will also alter their behavior depending on the temperature. If it's a really hot day, you're not going to see a lot of like mammals hanging out in direct sunlight, right? They may hang out in the shade or rest or take naps uh, during the middle of the day and then become more active at uh, dusk or maybe even at sunrise or something. Okay. Then uh, we have migration, which is a behavioral uh, response to the environment. So uh, animals can migrate for a number of reasons. Most likely it's going to be for food availability. So when we see up in the Arctic, a lot of birds migrate uh, south for winter um, for to find food when it's available. Or you have like, like the caribou migration or um, eels migrate. There, there's lots of organisms that migrate, uh, whether to find food or to reproduce. Now, what triggers that movement or that migration, though, uh, may vary. Some bird species, they migrate on the same day uh, every year. And then other ones will be in response to, like, changing daylight hours might trigger that it's time to migrate. Uh, now, scientists uh, a while ago were curious, how do they navigate? Um, they don't have, like, Google Maps, right? So how do they know where to go, especially if it's, like, a, a bird that was just born, like, you know, less than a year old has never migrated. How does it know how to reach its destination? Do they navigate by the stars, by the sun? Uh, so they did an experiment where they actually put magnets onto like uh, carrier pigeons. And what they found is that the pigeons 
were unable to return back home when they had magnets strapped to their heads. So scientists uh, kind of concluded in some cases that birds will use the Earth's magnetic field as like an internal compass for migration. So pretty rad. So here's two TED Ed videos I recommend watching on migration. Okay, so now though, let's go ahead and switch gears and talk about physiological mechanisms. So that's gonna be like uh, changes on the inside in response to the environment. So uh, one is circadian rhythms. So our circadian rhythms is, or are basically based on the rise and set of the sun, the quality and intensity and color of the light reaching our eyes, uh, signals the time of day and which genes to express. So when we first rise in the morning and we see the sunrise, that's gonna be um, like certain like uh, red wavelengths of light. And then high noon, midday, you're gonna have lots of blue light coming in. Uh, and then as the sun sets, the light will dim. We'll have less light coming into our eyes that signals it's time for bed. So all of the input coming in throughout our day is going to cause certain hormones to rise and fall within our bodies. So the amount of our cortisol, the amount of our mel melatonin, um, et cetera, is going to fluctuate. And that affects our alertness and also our like sleepiness. And it keeps us on this roughly 24 hour cycle of rise uh, and sleep. And so it does this not only by our hormones um, fluctuating, but then our hormones are gonna change our gene expression. And so uh, scientists have studied like human brain activity and we're more alert, we have higher rates of dopamine in the morning uh, and then that, so we're more productive versus like nighttime and when our hormone levels change and we begin to become more calm and slow our bodies down and prepare for bed. So uh, circadian rhythms have been found in pretty much all domains of life from bacteria to plants to animals. Uh, we follow this 24 hour, well in humans it's 24.2 hour uh, circadian rhythm cycle. Now this is pretty disruptive to people who work the night shift um, that goes against our natural circadian rhythms and they may experience some health problems and some issues from not following um, that circadian rhythm. So plants also have circadian rhythms. Now think about how beautiful this is. Plants do photosynthesis only when it's daytime and there's light, right? So that makes sense that when the light shines on the plants, that turns on gene expression to make the materials necessary for photosynthesis during daytime. <laughs> anyway, uh, there's a really cool TED Ed video on plant circadian rhythms that I also recommend. Now, when we talk about other physiological changes in organisms in response to the environment uh, would be in times of like really cold, like wintertime or summertime. So hibernation and estivation are a state of inactivity um, and reduced metabolic rate. So if you are a mammal who lives in cold temperatures, think about like when the snow falls, it can be very difficult to find food. Uh, the leaves have fallen off trees. Um, animals, maybe your prey maybe has migrated. So some animals have evolved to go into hibernation, which slows down the met metabolic rate and helps them survive this time period um, of the year that is very difficult to find enough calories to survive. And the same can be true of desert animals uh, in this process called estivation, where it's, you can think about it like during summertime, where they are going to, it's not hibernate, it's estivate, uh, but it's the same idea. They're going to reduce their activity and metabolic rate, and they can um, survive the hot, dry conditions of the summer. So uh, we also have, uh, in plants, we have this, concept, I guess, called phototropism. And in phototropism, the plants can actually change their um, like cellular structure to curve and grow towards the light. Here, this picture on the left is actually a picture of my bookshelf in my room, but you can see on uh, this uh, vine plant here on the left, the vines have actually started to grow over my books. And then you see the other plants all curving towards the window. Now, when we look at uh, some experiments, this was actually done by Charles Darwin and his son uh, years and years ago, 100 years ago, right? So what he noticed is when they shine light on a plant, it grows towards the, it curves towards the light. So they were curious, like, well, what is causing this? And so what they did is they cut the top of the plant off 
and the plant didn't grow towards the light. Hmm, well there must be something produced in the top of the plant that causes it to curve. So then what they did is they took and they covered it with like foil or something where light could not shine through and the plant did not curve towards the light. Well then they took that same thing and they covered it with something like see-through and now when the light could go through, oh, it curved towards the light. And then they took and they covered the base of the, of the growing stem with foil or something opaque and it curved towards the light. So um, then they did an experiment where they cut the top off the plant and then put like a gelatin. So think of like jello texture where chemicals could still diffuse through it. And they found that the plant did curve towards the light. And then in the last one, they put something um, that, well, mica, which I think is like a, like a element, like from rocks, and they put it between the tip and the stem and it did not curve. So the conclusions that they drew from this experiment is that, wow, there must be some kind of chemical or something produced in the top of the growing stem that when exposed to light causes it to curve and grow towards the light. So it turns out with further experiments over the decades that there was a hormone produced by plants that was discovered and this hormone is called auxin. And what will happen is the auxin is like, if here I have my phone right here, let me shine my flashlight. So if I have my, so there's my light. If the light is shining on my hand right here, the shady side is this side, right? On the back. So what will happen is auxin is going to move to the shady side and cause the plant to grow towards the light. So if this was my shade side, this is where the auxin is going to accumulate. And what you can see is those cells on the shade side elongate. And by stretching out, it causes the plant to curve towards the light. <laughs> uh, plants also have these uh, receptor proteins, just like we saw in unit four for AP Bio with cell communication, uh, plant, like with a protein receptor. Instead of a ligand, plants can actually respond to light and the light can activate the receptor protein and then activate a signal transduction pathway and a cell response. So plants can also respond to light. Okay, and then we have uh, this thing called photoperiodism in plants. And this is how plants are gonna respond to changes in the length of day and night. Because when we think about the earth rotating, uh, like throughout the year, like a rotating around the sun, um, and like throughout our different seasons, in winter time, our days are shorter, and in summertime, our days are longer, like the sun sets late at night in summer. So the plants respond to that. And with that, they did some experiments. So they had this plant that would bloom when the night was very long and there was a short amount of daylight. So to us, that's winter time in the Northern Hemisphere, I'm in California. <laughs> uh, and what they did though, they were like, hmm, is it the length of sun that signals, hey, it's winter time? Or is it the length of night that signals when to flower? So what they did is they took this extended period of darkness and they flashed a light. And what they found is that the flowers did not, or the plants did not flower. Ooh, so is it un like a short amount of daylight or is it a long night that is important for determining whether or not this flower blooms? Well, it turns out that these are called short day plants, that the plants flower with uninterrupted darkness um, when it exceeds a critical night length. Like there has to be a certain amount of uninterrupted darkness in order for that plant to be signaled that it's winter time and now it's time for us to flower. Now the opposite is also true for plants that flower in summertime, right? So here, if the night is too long, they think, it, think <laughs> it's winter and they won't bloom. But if they have a long night and then they expose them with um, flashes of light, then that interrupts the period of darkness and now the plant will flower. So we call these uh, long day plants. So these plants flower with uninterrupted, when un <laughs> when uninterrupted darkness is less than critical night length. Okay, now let's go ahead though, and uh, we can also talk about, um, I think I'm gonna pause my video here and make a part two.